I will say that the, ta the paper that was published in the Journal of Feminist Studies and Religion is also going to be appearing in a slightly modified form in the new volume that Lou Kreisberg and Catherine Gerard are editing for PARC, uh, Case Studies in you know, Better or Worse Relations, or BO, as we tend to call it, <laughs> Better or Worse. I hope mine isn't worse. <laughs> um, so this is a, I'm, I'm in the process of revising a paper that I gave at a conference on the history of sisters in Dublin this summer. And um, it is on the concept of sacraments being used as weapons by clerics to control sisters. But it also has examples of women in authority in religious communities using sacraments as a method of controlling those subordinates of theirs within the community. What you need to understand is that in the 19th century and, and before, and even today in some more traditional communities, the person in leadership is referred to either as a general superior or a mother general. And in the rules that I read for the 19th century, the people who were not in leadership were, were actually called inferiors. So if you have superiors, those who were not superiors were inferiors. So there was a real hierarchy. And um, many communities of sisters, most in the United States and many throughout the world, have arrived at much more consensual and collaborative methods of decision making and exercising authority. Um, and that's a lot of what I talked about in my other piece. Um, but the term kyriarchy is one that I just want to explain briefly. It was developed by feminist theologian Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, who teaches at Harvard Divinity School. And Schusler Fiorenza developed this term around 25 years ago now. Um, and let me just read the technical definition of kyriarchy. Kyriarchy is a Greek term meaning lordship. Kyrie, meaning lord, uh, is a word she coined to connote sets of connecting and interconnecting social arrangements built around domination, oppression, and submission. A theory of interconnecting, interacting, and self-extending systems of domination and submission. A system rooted in understandings of power that are structural and not necessarily gendered, although they often are, so that women can exercise kyriarchy or lordship over other women or over men. Um, and that's why it's preferable to patriarchy and it's preferable to clericalism because not all of those who exercise this power are clerics, okay? Um, it was developed before the term intersectionality came into widespread use, but it is a form of intersectionality, okay? And the interesting thing about it is that in some circumstances, people can either be the, the exercisers of kyriarchy or those who are victimized by it. So you're not always in the same position in this relationship. So I'm gonna try not to use the word a lot, because I don't like jargon, but it is an important word, and it's one that in this published version I intend to spend some time on. Um, last year, Elizabeth Schusser Fiorenza published a book in which she really developed this concept more extensively. Uh, I had not read it when I wrote the paper for Dublin, but I read it this summer. It's really interesting. It's called Congress of Women, Religion, Gender, and Kyriarchal Power, and it was an important work as I continue to develop my ideas. And another book that I discovered this summer, embarrassingly, because I know Susan Ross, the author, um, is uh, Extravagant Affections of Feminist Sacramental Theology. This is an older book. Um, let me just say one thing. I do have an appointment in the religion department, but I am not a theologian. And so part of my nervousness in dealing with this topic is that I'm dealing more explicitly with theology in some ways than I have in anything else I've written, with one minor exception. And 
So I'm a little bit nervous about it. I have been uh, sharing this work as it evolves with a couple of people who are theologians, so I'm comfortable with it, but believe me, I'm, I'm open to all kinds of suggestions. I also want this to be accessible to people who are neither historians nor theologians and those who know nothing about nuns. So if there are things that I talk about that are just unfamiliar to you, either stop me or tell me you really need to do more to explain X as I continue to, um, to develop this for publication. So the idea for this paper came to me a number of years ago when I was doing research in the archives of the Dominican Sisters of Racine, Wisconsin. And I came across it. Many communities kept a house diary where they would just record the events of the day in one or two sentences. There was an entry, it was originally in German, but helpfully a scholar has translated the house diary from the 19th century into English. Um, and two days before Christmas in 1871, Mother Hyacintha Oberbrunner, who was the superior general at the time, wrote in the house diary, and this is a direct quote of the English translation, no holy communion today. Father didn't give it to us because we were not good. Now, I don't know what a group of maybe, at this point, 15 German immigrant sisters could have done to make them all not good. But they were deprived of communion on the decision without any recourse of this priest. I mean, he could have been having a bad day. Who knows? And I started thinking about that. And as I continued to do research and as I continued to read, I found more and more examples of this kind of exercise of arbitrary authority, um, using sacraments as a mechanism of control. I also found examples of sisters in authority using it as a mechanism of control over other sisters. And this was a particularly complicated thing for 19th century nuns and for nuns in any period because um, on the one hand, the sacraments were extremely central to their identity and their spirituality as Catholic nuns. The idea among Catholics is that communion, for example, represents the actual body and blood of Jesus that has been brought into being through the ministry of a priest, and only a priest. And um, so they can't do it for themselves. And this is really, the idea of receiving communion is a very central act of Catholic devotion and practice. So to be deprived of it is really a major deprivation for, for nuns. So the point of this paper is to give some examples of this. The part I need to develop more fully, and I am developing more fully, is to develop examples of resistance, to identify examples of resistance by sisters, and then finally to talk about why this becomes even more problematic in the 20th century. Um, in, and, and this is where I'm going to end my talk today, with the 20th century thing. And I've talked this over with historians, I've talked it over with theologians, I've talked it over with all kinds of scholars, and they say nobody's written on this. And I have not been able to find anything on this. So I think it's an original <coughs> idea, I think it's an important idea, and if you know of somebody else who's written on it, I would be devastated, but I'd rather be embarrassed here than by publishing this and so I said, well, what about the work of so-and-so? So, anyway. So that was the first example that I came for. You also have to keep in mind that among Catholics, only men can be ordained, and therefore only men can be those who can produce the body and blood of Christ in the, in the Mass and can also exercise other sacramental responsibilities. And so it's particularly problematic when you have a congregation that is made up entirely of sisters, of women, and yet the sacramental dimension of their practice requires the ministry of a man. And so that adds a layer of complication to all this. So this is a picture of an early Racine Dominican sister. I couldn't find a picture of Mother Hyacintha <laughs> um, I, I'm going to probably write to the archivist to see if there is one. This is actually the founding, the foundress of the community. So 
uh, Mother Benedicta. Um, <laughs> but um, sisters, you have to understand, wanted communion. They wanted communion frequently. And in the 19th century, most sisters' constitutions or rules specified when and how often they could receive communion. And it might differ by rank. For example, in some constitutions, I have an example here, the 1888 Constitution of the Dubuque, Iowa Franciscans specified that novices and postulants were both, those are people in candidacy, they haven't taken vows, postulant is the first stage, novice is the second stage, that they both could had to go to confession once a week. Uh, but postulants could only receive communion once a week, but novices could receive it twice. In most communities, it was specified that people could only receive communion three times a week. And that was a fairly modern and enlightened practice. Um, the Franciscans of Milwaukee noted in theirs that the sisters receive Holy Communion if circumstances admit as often as the rule permits. Nonetheless, the superior may refuse sister's Holy Communion, but she must clear it with the confessor, that is, the chaplain. So she couldn't do it on her own authority. Can I, can I throw in something? Yes. The, the, what you said about the enlightenment of three times a week might deserve the following context, that the Catholic Church in the 19th century was very pietistic in terms of almost separation of the priest and the people, but also of communion and its reception. Oh, absolutely, that, absolutely. That communion was not like available like McDonald's. But it was available to the sisters who had full-time chaplains and went to mass daily, but they could still not receive. Yeah. So, I'm just saying the whole context is that communion well, was And not, I'm going to address that at the end of my paper. Yeah. So, so hold that thought. Yeah. Hold that thought. Um, Women could not hear confessions, of course, because that, that's also a sacrament, the sacrament of penance. Um, and uh, there was a special edict issued in 1890 by Pope Leo XIII warning sisters, warning superiors of religious communities not to require manifestations of conscience from their uh, members and saying that that was a practice reserved only for priests. Um, OK. so. Let me give you an example from nearby in Stella, Niagara, New York, which is near Buffalo. Um, and this woman has, uh, this is from the biography of their mother foundress, Mother Magdalene Damon. Um, the greatness of Mother Magdalene's humility is brilliantly demonstrated in a little incident here. Uh, the rector or the chaplain, perhaps fearing that the great spiritual favors bestowed by God upon Mother Magdalena might have made her proud or perhaps also to try her humility, one morning passed her intentionally when she presented herself with the other sisters at the communion rail, and she obediently accepted his judgment and went back to her place in the pew. Um, again, this is, this is using this to control her. She had no recourse for this. Um, later, he, he relented, and he... A lot, he decided she had become humble enough, or maybe humiliated enough, and allowed her to receive communion again, for which she was duly grateful. Soon thereafter, he relented. Um, and then, in another community, Sister St. Andrew Feltine of the Saint, San Antonio uh, Sisters of Divine Providence, having submitted and complied with conditions imposed on her, is hereby now allowed again to receive Holy Communion. And so this kind of language is found repeatedly in the records of religious congregations. In a less drastic but still traumatic situation, Mother Marie Anne Blondine, who is now Blessed Mother Marie Anne Blondine, of the Canadian Sisters of St. Anne, found it impossible to go to confession to the chaplain of the congregation because he was such a bastard. She didn't say that, I did. Um, so he, in turn, forbade the sisters to go to confession to anyone other than himself, which is technically not kosher, but they had no recourse because he was the chaplain of the community and said mass for them every day. Um, Mother Marie Anne acknowledged the situation with sardonic humor 
when asked how she could accept such ongoing mortification and disgrace, replied that her superior was, quote, God's messenger sent to prune me, and continuing the horticultural metaphor, declared that her community was able to grow so rapidly because our Lord planted the root, namely herself, in so much manure. <laughs> um, so these are people who had senses of humor about it, but that doesn't mean they weren't frustrated. One superior in the United States, the founder of several communities, mainly in the South, of Sisters of Mercy, um, referred to a guy who was first bishop in Mississippi and then later in New Orleans, um, and writing to a friend of hers in the congregation as that miserable man who wears the mitre, and everybody knew who she meant. Um, so sisters were trained to submit to authority, and one of the evidences of resistance that I've found, and I don't discuss it yet, but I'm in the process of writing it, is, oh, and here are some of these sisters. I'm so sorry, I haven't shown you all these lovely pictures. Yeah, these pictures are so exciting. Mother Joseph of the Sacred Heart Parisot, who wrote a very complex plea for being allowed to receive communion daily, a plea that was not responded to favorably. She is the only sister who has a statue in Statuary Hall although maybe if they remove some of the Confederate generals, there'll be room for some more nuns. <laughs> I don't know. Um, these are some other ones. This is Magdalene Dama, Damon that I told you about earlier, and this is Mother St. Andrew, and this is Blessed um, Marie Blondine, and this is the woman, the Sister of Mercy, who talked about the miserable man who wears the mitre. These were amazing women. She, by the way, was a professor of history, so I have special fondness for Mother Austin Carroll. Um, here's a description um, that appeared in a four-volume work on Christian spirituality that I found in the libraries of many of the communities where I did research, and I've done research in about five dozen congregations, archives in the United States. The powers and functions of the priest consist in producing Jesus Christ, in giving the Holy Spirit to the church, and in sanctifying the faithful, in giving even the Eternal Father by giving Jesus Christ to the faithful in communion. The power to produce Christ raises the priest so high that the writers of the French school dare to compare him to the Blessed Virgin. If the sanctity of the Blessed Virgin be so great because she brought forth Jesus Christ and his weakness, how great should be the sanctity of priests called to cooperate in the divine and glorious generation of Holy Communion. So, um, this kind of rhetoric is really rather remarkable. Um, women were trained very <clears throat> repeatedly and deliberately not to resist the authority of priests. And yet, in terms of resistance, I find so many examples of superiors, women superiors, writing to their sisters, telling them to be respectful of priests. And the message of this is not that they should be respectful of priests, but that they aren't being. And that's why the message needs to be constantly reiterated to them. So by the subtext is, you're not doing this, you should. And I found that in many communities around the country. So the problem was that priests were not perfect. Gee. And um, despite the amount of authority that was given to them, um, they were not you know, many of them did not live up to the standards they were supposed to. Not that all women in authority did either. Um, and another penalty that a priest could impose upon them, or a bishop, was to put an individual or community under interdict, which was one step short of communion, but uh, uh, excommunication. But it meant that they were penalized in some way. They could not receive the sacraments, then they could not... Um, they needed to reconcile themselves through the sacrament of penance before they would be allowed. And to be allowed to receive the sacrament of penance, they had to be duly sorry for whatever they had done that was offensive. Sometimes they didn't know what it was because it was uh, punishment was opposed, imposed arbitrarily. The, the longest 19th century tenured bishop in the United States was a bishop, um, William McCloskey, who served in Louisville from 1868 to 1909. So that was a long time. And he was, he was awful. I went to the sesquicentennial, spoke at the sesquicentennial of a community in that archdiocese many years ago. And 
um, then went to a celebration in the cathedral where the then archbishop spoke. And the first thing he said was he apologized for all of the damage um, and authoritarianism of his predecessors, especially this guy. So William McCloskey put the Sisters of Loretto under interdict, and it was so outrageous. Among other things, he deprived them of a chaplain. He told them they could not receive new members into the community, even though the date of their reception into the community was announced. Families were traveling to Kentucky to witness the ceremony and so forth. He just simply said, no, you can't do it. So in order to stop this, um, this is Bishop McCloskey, um, Mother Praxides Cardi went to the abbot of Gethsemane Trappist Abbey. Those of you who have heard of Thomas Merton, that's where in the 20th century Thomas Merton would be a monk. Um, and she went to him and he went for her to Washington, D.C. <coughs> and spoke to the papal nuncio. And there are three letters, one before he went to Washington, one from Washington, one when he got back, to have the interdict lifted by the papal nuncio or ambassador from the Vatican. Um, so that they could receive candidates into the community. And um, Bishop McCloskey did not appreciate this. Um, and so eventually when Bishop McCloskey died in um, 1909, this is what was recorded in the house diary of the Sisters of Loretto. Our beloved Bishop's last dig was the heading of the uh, Entry, and it said, <laughs> Before another November comes, our dear bishop and exerciser is dead, and Mother Praxides is one of the chief mourners at his funeral. And you just have this image of her in the front row, mourning loudly. But one didn't need to be a bishop in order to uh, wreak havoc in women's religious life. Here's one of my favorite examples. Father Peter DeRue. Father Peter DeRue, I found evidence of him in the archives of five different religious congregations, four of which left his parish in utter disgust and outrage because he was so awful to them. And he kept having to go farther and farther away in order to find sisters. Finally, he finds the Philadelphia Franciscan sisters. I mean, he's in Baker, Oregon, and he has to go all the way to Philadelphia to find sisters willing to work with him. And um, I just happened to know a woman who was a Philadelphia Franciscan stationed in Portland when I was there to do research in another community's archives. So this I found totally uh, unexpectedly. I wasn't planning to do research there. Um, but anyway, um, he came to their, he, he decided that they were going to be required to run an academy where they taught, among other things, physics and Greek, neither of which they knew they were primary school teachers. And then after they'd been there a few weeks, he comes to the front door of the convent and says, I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm going away, uh, goodbye. And they thought, okay, he'll be back like tomorrow. But he was away for a few weeks. We found out later he was probably being treated for alcoholism. Mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't know that. Um, and so, oh, he also served them a welcoming meal when they arrived in... Um, Oregon, and then presented them with a bill for the food, which I thought was particularly offensive. So the priest left, and there was no mass. And so they wrote to the Mother General back in Philadelphia and said, what do we do? And Mother Agnes writes back and says, go to the next parish. Now keep in mind, even with the Pony Express and railroads, this was taking a long time to get the mail back and forth. So they wrote back to her and said, you know, we informed Mother that the next parish was 90 miles away and not convenient for regular worship. Besides, there have been several robberies on the stagecoach between here and there in recent weeks, and we are reluctant to expose ourselves to such danger. So on their own, they solved the problem. They started going to the Methodist Church. <laughs> so this was an early example of ecumenism. The sisters are still, by the way, in Oregon. Not those particular sisters. Anyway, um, I could go on and on, but, but let me get to my, my larger theological point here. This goes on, and then in the early 20th century, Pope Pius X issues a number of rulings which open up communion more freely 
to practicing Catholics, for which largely he has been canonized. He is now Saint Pope Pius X, or Pope Saint Pius X. And um, one of these uh, opened up communion to children when they were roughly seven or eight years old, rather than waiting until they were teenagers. And the other was to encourage and uh, frequent even daily communion for practicing Catholics. And he has been generally praised for this, and he has been generally lauded for this, and many people feel he was made a saint because of this. I, however, have a different interpretation of this. And that, this is where I'm going to end this article. Uh, my argument is that by doing these things, Pius X more explicitly and more forcefully placed sacramental practices at the center of Catholic spirituality and made sacraments at the center of what it means to be a good practicing Catholic. And therefore, it clericalized Catholic spirituality to a greater degree than it ever had been before. And that this is a particular problem for women. It's not only a problem for women, but it's a particular problem for women. Um, so, um, I, I want to end my, my um, paper with a discussion of that when I publish it. Um, he said in uh, Sacra Trentina in 1905, frequent and daily communion as a practice most early, earnestly desired by Christ, for which there's no evidence, and by the Catholic Church, should be open to all the faithful of whatever rank and condition of life. And so um, I'm not saying that he did this intentionally to clericalize Catholic practice, or that there are no positive benefits for Catholic practice for, from frequent communion. But one consequence of this has been an increased clericalization of Catholic practice and of Catholic spirituality, and uh, making men, ordained men, ab absolutely essential to one's capacity to be a devout and good member of the church. So this is where I want to end this. Does this perhaps enhance or exacerbate the chances that kyriarchal assertions of priestly primacy are more likely than ever, more likely now than a century and a half ago. Could this also play a role in facilitating clerical abuses of power in other regards as well in the 20th century? All of this is speculative, but I do believe it has some basis uh, and some persuasive power. In any event, 19th century sisters were well aware of what might devolve from the authority of men who too aggressively exercised the privileges of holy orders. Thus, shortly before her death in 1907, reflecting on having successfully secured pontifical approval for her community, that is, approval from the Vatican, so it wasn't just approved by the local bishop, but by the Vatican hierarchy and the Pope, um, Mother, Saint, Mother Mary Augusta Anderson, of um, the Sisters of the Holy Cross, where the sisters across the street from the University of Notre Dame, the Fathers of the Holy Cross, run the University of Notre Dame, wrote the following declaration to a confidant after getting her community finally out from <coughs> under the really abusive power of the founding superior of the Holy Cross Fathers, Edward Soren. I have asked God for only one thing. What I have had to suffer does not count. I have asked him to fix my sisters so that no man can ever lay his hand upon them. I ask nothing more. God has done what I asked. And then she died. Um, and then there is the case of, uh, and here is Mother Augusta Anderson. And then there is the case of Margaret Anna Cusack, the founder of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace, who was a convert from Protestantism and who shortly after she said this left the Catholic Church <laughs> and eventually would die again as a member of the Anglican Church. As she wrote in the US edition of her memoirs, written shortly after she left her order but before her self-imposed ex exile from Catholicism, quote, the crushing hand of ecclesiastical despotism stifles every cry of suffering or complaint. I know that Roman Catholics will cry out with indignation and Protestants with amazement when I say that the sisterhoods in the Roman Catholic Church have often succeeded, not because of the help of the church, 
but in the face of its determined and, I might say, often cruel opposition. So that, you've seen the beginning and you've seen the end. You see the point I'm trying to make at the end. I need to flesh it out a little bit in the middle, but that's where this is going. I welcome comments, feedback, suggestions. Yes. Yeah, I actually have two questions related sure. to methods. So the central premise of this is that um, you have patriarchal, you have priests using power, um, perhaps arbitrarily to yes. deny privileges. And so related to methods, how do you, and I have two questions. The first mm -hmm. one is, how do you distinguish what power is arbitrary and what is related to the canon? Mm -hmm. and two, That's a good question. And two, uh, in terms of your methods, can you talk about your sampling frame, your mm -hmm. sample size, and, and kind of how you decided to, to do that? And also... Sure. Um, okay. So the first question was, how do I distinguish between what is canonical and what is non-canonical? That's a really interesting question, especially in the 19th century, because all of these communities were non-canonical until 1908, 1901. Uh, it was in 1900 that the Pope issued a statement making communities of unenclosed sisters, not in solemn vows, those who were not contemplatives, who, but those who were engaged in ministry, recognizing that they were real sisters, mm -hmm. that they were real religious. So all of this is kind of happening extra canonically in terms of canon law. But having said that, um, one of the ways that I find it is through this kind of create, finding the creative subversion of what sisters are constantly being warned against um, based upon their practice and what they're actually doing. Um, so as I find continuing reminders to sisters about you must respect the priests, you must do this, I also learned that was one sign. The other sign that I found was repeated. So, I, so is that, that's a sign that power is being used arbitrarily by the priests? Yes, or? yes, that the priests are doing things that the sisters find um, intolerable. So I guess that. The, but let me let me let me finish what I what I do. Um, I also learned to read between the lines, and I did check this out with other historians and with other sisters. There are a lot of. Very, very rarely do you find an example in the archives which says, we withdrew because of the authoritarian pastor. We, re we withdrew from this parish, or we, re we withdrew from this diocese. And there were several cases where sisters just up and moved the entire community. Um, but what they did talk about was eccentric priests, unfortunate bishops, and things like that. And as you looked at what these people did, you realized that they were using euphemisms. But what they were doing is saying, there is nobody controlling what these guys are doing to us. And that's why when Father Albrecht of the um, of Gethsemane Abbey went to Washington, it was so extraordinary. Because they knew that, that the papal nuncio would not listen to them, but they would listen to a Trappist abbot who had the powers of the bishop. Um, and so... You know, first of all, my point is not that all priests or all bishops were bad. Almost all of these communities found allies within the clergy. Um, it is impossible to quantify this, but I will say this. I've been to 60, there were 425 communities in the United States as of 1917. I've been to 60 archives, and I've read the history of over 400 of these communities. So I'm not using a sample. I'm using the entire population insofar as I can. Um, and what I found is repeated examples of this kind of behavior. Um, I'm not saying it happened everywhere. I would never say that. But I would say it happened often enough to resonate and be unremarkable and to be a fairly commonplace form of behavior that sisters needed to respond to. So just as a follow-up, you're not vilifying priests, which I think is, is correct, and, and by that, no, at I'm the same not. time, on the flip side, the work seems to be based on the premise that these sisters are pursuing correct action, or that they're behaving in a way that is consistent with whatever the religious canon or, or values are, and that priests are punishing, right? But it, it could be that they're insubordinate because they're insubordinate, or something so I but guess who gets to decide what insubordinate behavior so, so this is. is what I'm saying. As a reviewer, I would push back on the characterization of the sisters as being 
because the premise seems to be that they're pursuing correct action, but that the priests are coming down on them. This is what I'm hearing here. I'm not trying to argue correct. I'm trying to argue pastoral. And I think there's a difference. Um, what I am suggesting, and I would be absolutely able to substantiate this, is that the power, and, I, and I've got it from constitutions, I've got it from all kinds of things. I do not have it from canon law, because canon law was not, canon, was not codified until 1917. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no canon law. You can't say according to canon 492, this, da, da, da. There's probably some sort of, it's something that well, that's why it was canon. Answer. That was why it was codified in 1917, because there wasn't. But what I can do is point to the fact that sisters are repeatedly being asked to violate the terms of their constitutions, which have been approved either at the local level or at the Vatican level or both, um, and that when they refuse to to do things that are contrary to their rule, they are punished. This goes back to 1727, the first community of sisters to be in what is now the United States, who are the New Orleans Ursulines. And they were deprived of, it said in their, in their constitutions, that they had the right to select their own chaplain. And they were deprived of that. And they fell victim to conflict between, this is, it's a long story, so I don't want to go into it, but they fell victim to <laughs> tensions and, and, and ongoing hostility between the Jesuits and the Franciscans who shared jurisdiction over New Orleans. And they wanted a Jesuit chaplain, and the governor of the, of the colony gave them a Franciscan, and they refused. And was this canon law? No. But it was part of their constitutions that had been canonically approved. Um, and they said, this is a violation. And they, were, they went so far as to say, if you do not let us have the chaplain that we select, as we are supposed to be able to do, we will leave and go to the Caribbean. We will leave New Orleans. And they were ready to go. But their services were so much in demand in New Orleans that the authorities relented. And that was the power they had. Now, is this canonical? No. But neither is what, I mean, it's, it, this is all arbitrary because it's not codified. And that makes it easier for a priest to do well, this. In, in the sense, though, that, that their constitution was ratified with that, within that, it is that canonical. Yeah. Well, their power was canonical, but the yeah. power of, the, there were no ca canons that they could refer to specifically and say, according to four, you know, canon 492, subsection B, um, a priest should not be able to do this, or a priest must do that. There was nothing like that that they could refer to. And so the question, so what they had was that they were largely in a seller's market. Their services were such that people wanted them to do what they could do. And they could threaten, and often did threaten, to up and move somewhere else if, they didn't get their way. However, having said that, that becomes increasingly difficult as the communities become increasingly established and successful in material terms. Because when you've only got 15 sisters and you're living in a rented house somewhere, it's pretty easy to move across several states, even in the early 19th <laughs> century. Once you've built a big monument of a mother house and you're paying for the mortgage on it, and um, you know you have physical institutions that are quite sizable, it's much harder to pick up and move. And that's why the last chapter of the book that I'm writing is called From Ministry to Monuments. And I talk about the difference between qualitative and quantitative measurements of success and of spiritual <coughs> freedom. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, and it probably doesn't. But I will say that I've run across enough of these examples in enough communities around the country, so it's not you know, some single diocese like Louisville where this is happening, to see this as recurrent and problematic. No, I would never say this happened everywhere, but I would say it happened in a lot of places. It is very hard to quantify this because not all communities have good archives. Some of them lost their archives in fires. 
I've been to some of those. Some of them have never organized their archives. I went to four congregations that had blind archivists, um, which presents different challenges. Some of them were remarkable, by the way. Um, but it's, it's impossible to quantify, and I would never try to quantify anything that I argue. I would never want to say this happened in 63.7% of cases or in, you know, 42% of dioceses or anything like that. I can't do that. But what I can talk about are patterns that are recurrent, that are persistent, and that are troubling. And I would never go further than that in terms of trying to, um, to make a case. I would never go further than that. Yes? So <clears throat> the uh, Abbot of Gethsemane, of course, was not dependent on the bishop of Lexington mm -mm. because monasteries in the centuries earlier. Yeah, they were an exempt monastery. Had, had, uh, they were an exempt They were an exempt monastery. Jurisdiction, local, and that's why I said he had the powers of a bishop. Right. So, but in a way, I'm just wondering what you think of, uh, from the bishop's point of view, uh, the sisters going to the abbot is sort of not playing for faith. They're poor either. <laughs> they were, by the way, a pontifical congregation. They were not a diocesan um, but congregation. But still, they're, they're, I mean, this is a question of whose perspective you're taking, because they're sort of going outside the rules, aren't they, by appealing well, to, the, to the abbot? Of course they were. Yeah. And they were, and and the reason that they did it, the first letter ta is which the abbot wrote before he went to Washington was, I understand why you're doing this, and you have to do it. You have no recourse. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, you know, it shouldn't have to be this way, but and and, you know, there's enough evidence about Bishop McCloskey. He this was not the only community. It wasn't like there was some kind of problem here. There there was an article that appeared. I think it was in the 1980s, in the Catholic Historical Review by a priest on McCloskey's authoritarianism that actually deals mainly with the resistance and resentment of the priests of the, arch, of the diocese, or archdiocese, I guess it's an archbishop, but anyway, um, against him. So it was by no means directed solely at women, or and that's why I think the concept of kiriarchy is so useful, that it's not a gendered concept, although it is often reflected in gender situations. And so you're absolutely right that they went outside the structures. Absolutely right. But that's because he first went outside the structures in assuming authority. He was, I didn't go into this, but he was investigated by the Vatican for an over-assertion of authority. Unfortunately, the person that they, that they put in charge of the investigation was a former student and mentee of his at the North American College. So um, he said, yeah, it's a problem, but I can't really do anything about it. And instead, what he did was he deposed Mother Praxity's predecessor as superior of the Sisters of Loretto for raising trouble. It was weird. One additional question, of course. Sure. And then the assembly would have a French connection because of the tie to his mother. Right. And, Although uh, they were no longer, they were independent. Yes. Well, within the, 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 the yeah. Cistercian system, they sure. still, still have a mother-house yeah. mother sure. relationship. They're visited by yeah. the So the point is, did ethnicity enter? So did the Sister Loretto, that community, were they... They, they were largely, Irish? but not exclusively, Irish. They were Irish. But by bishop, this time, the bishop was German. German. Ulbrich. So it wasn't ganging up, French people ganging up against... Uh, no, it, the ethnicity was not really, by then, the issue. Both communities were fairly diverse by then. The, Loretta, the Loretto's... When I grew up in the Catholics going to the Catholic parish, and Tom wouldn't go to the French parish. Right. Catholic An intermarriage was Catholic versus German Catholic. Church, I, mean, you know, right. I have an article on ethnicity, if you'd like to read it, actually. Yes. The most frequent sacrifice yeah. provided by priests. But have you tried to uh, investigate on free monkeys? No. Interesting time, question. Have, I mean, it would have been like really, really, really bastardly wow. not to administer. But, but what I have found is when a <laughs> chaplain was removed, I mean, the, the bishop, even for communities approved by Rome, the bishop was responsible for approving and appointing a chaplain. Now, 
Having said that, if a sister's community was a member of a, one of the larger orders, Dominican, Franciscan, etc., they would oftentimes have a chaplain from that, but they still had to be approved by the local bishop to serve. And so if a bishop withdrew a chaplain, said, we are not going to appoint a chaplain to your community, as happened with the Sisters of Loretto and other communities, um, then of course that would be another deprivation that would occur. And in fact, that community in New Orleans that I talked about in the 1720s did face that because the founding superior, Mother Augustine Tranchepain, died in the early 1730s. And they were still dealing with this problem between the Franciscans and the Jesuits. And it said, in a concession, she was allowed to receive the last rites from this Jesuit priest. Mm -hmm. But it was, so, so yes, that is an issue. I confess, confess that I don't have as much detail on that. But you're absolutely right, that would be an issue. That would be an issue. And that's a good point. Thank you. Sorry, is, so is there a, a section in the paper that deals with when a priest legitimately can refuse communion and it's mortal sin and, and all of it? But, um, it's really hard in this period because it's not codified. What I have in here, and I do have a long section which I didn't want to bore you yeah, with. No, I figured there was something in there. Uh, and I'll just show you to prove that I have it. <laughs> I like to prove that I have it. So there's nothing in writing about what... About well, there, there, sure, there, there is increasingly, and there's work, there's, there's studies of canon law, and this is one of the reasons why canon law was codified. These are excerpts from constitutions. Mm -hmm. That's, when the constitution is approved, it, it spells out the obligations on both sides. This is what the obligation of the priest is, this is what the obligation of, you know, of the chaplain. And, and keep in mind that every community of sisters Every community of sisters at this point in our history, in, in history, had a male ultimate superior. If they were approved at the diocese, at the diocesan level, the, the ecclesiastical superior would be appointed by the bishop. If they were a pontifical community, it would be appointed in Rome and it was usually a cardinal. And this was one of the advantages of being pontifical, was that your superior was some cardinal who was also the superior of 150,000 other nuns around the world and probably didn't even know where you know, Louisville, Kentucky was or whatever. So it gave you a lot more autonomy. But he could step in if he wanted to. And it's, I, have a, I, I have an article that I published a number of years ago on why sisters sought pontifical status. And it was largely because that gave them more autonomy. Um, and the sisters of Loretto did that. And the, the last remaining serious power that the Bishop of Louisville had over them was the appointment of a chaplain. And so that was how he exercised control over them, was by withdrawing the chaplain. Because he couldn't do some of the other things. He tried, when they were still approved by the diocese, he tried, for example, to assert authority, and it was in their early constitution, that the bishop had to approve who they could admit to membership in the community or he could insist that they admit other people to the community. And one of the things, those Holy Cross sisters, when she said, I wanted to fix it so no man would ever, the, bish, the, the superior of the Holy Cross fathers at Notre Dame was angry because the sisters refused to do housework for the priests. And so he founded his own little group of bedmakers and laundresses and called them Holy Cross sisters, dressed them in that habit, and they went to Rome, the sisters went to Rome and said, who are these women? And they have nothing to do with us. And finally, when they became pontifical, of course, they also took in those women because they felt sorry for them. They had been you know, misled and deluded. But that's the kind of thing that was happening. So it's not always around sacraments. But sacraments were on both sides of this relationship where the power was really centered, right? The priests knew that the sisters wanted the sacraments and in a spiritual sense needed the sacraments. And the sisters knew that they could not provide these without the ministry of these priests. Now, in many of these cases, including the example I gave you of the abbot of Gethsemane, of course, it was priests who were their most powerful allies. 
So I, you know, when I, I once, one of the early talks I gave to a large national group of sisters, I asked the question, was, how many of your communities in your history had contention and tensions with clerical authorities? And there were representatives of 100, over 100 communities in that audience. Almost every hand went up. And I said, and how many of you received support from priests in responding to those tensions? <laughs> Almost the same number of hands went up. So I'm not trying to say priests bad, sisters good, priests authoritarian, sisters, you know, blameless. Of course there were priests who were supportive and who were um, allies of the sisters. And not all priests were, of course, arbitrary or vicious. But there were enough examples of it that you couldn't say, well, it just happened rarely, but unfortunately. No, it happened because of the authority these individuals exercised. And that's why the concept of curiarchy has come into widespread, wider spread usage, increasingly widespread usage, because it does describe a real and uh, frequent, not universal, phenomenon. I would argue. Yes, sir. How much, how much of all of this that you describe as in the 19th century, do you think it's still happening? Yes. To what extent the sacraments uh, are still being used? Uh, today? Well, I would say that that's a really complicated question. Um, it's still happening. I, again, impossible to quantify. Um, first of all, everybody is more mobile now than they were then. The situation of those sisters in Oregon who said the next parish is 90 miles away and we have to catch a stagecoach that's been robbed it doesn't happen anymore in most parts of the world. It does happen in Africa and in Asia and in Latin America a lot. And I'm not an expert on religious life in um, the Southern Hemisphere. But from what I have read, and there's been a lot of reporting on this, um, one of the really valuable sources of reporting on this is a, a website called Global Sisters Report, which reports on religious life among sisters around the world. In the United States, it's less of a problem, certainly. And it's less of a problem for a couple of reasons. One, because sisters have more options, for the most part. They can. And secondly, um, because sisters, I think, are better educated and have taken more responsibility for their own spirituality. Now, there are still limits to that. But I have, for at least the last 30, 35 years, I've seen examples of where the sacraments become divisive within religious communities um, among the sisters themselves, having nothing to do with priests. Okay. How, how to deal with that, how to compare it, hard to say. Uh, for example, uh, there are communities where there are some sisters who do not want to celebrate major occasions in their lives with a mass presided over by a priest. This becomes a problem when you've got several sisters celebrating their anniversary of taking their vows, for example. Uh, and many of them, maybe most of them, maybe all but one or two of them, are happy to go to a mass and have everybody there and celebrating and having the priest up there. And there are one or two who say, I can't do it. I can't do it. So what is supposed to be a unifying moment in their spirituality becomes a divisive moment. That book that I pointed out, Extravagant Affections of Feminist Sacramental Theology, does talk about does talk about that, and I recommend it. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it's going on, but it's going on in different ways, I would say. There also is canon law, and equally importantly, there are women who are trained as canon lawyers. So, And there are men who are also 
supportive and feminist and, and concerned about karaoke. So I'll simply point that out as well. Yes. Uh, just from the, the sacramental theology side, um, the thought occurred to me that there, the, the current limit is that you're supposed the maximum reception of communion is twice mm -hmm. twice a day, if you and unless you're a priest. Well, that's true. Yeah, but um, that's I'm just putting up kind of a boundary. There's the there's you might say it the temptation of people to say I've got to get close to God to be holy, and the holiest I can be is when I've just received the sacrament of communion. Right. There's no holier moment. You, you can posit that. That's Some people would argue true. that. Some people would argue that. So, yes. so there is this spectrum of the desire to get holy mm -hmm. and the definition of practicing love in service and care and respect as being the, the practical definition of holy. May I just insert, I have written about that too. And remember I said very early on that there was one other occasion when I ventured into sacramental theology. I wrote an article a long time ago called Service as Sacrament. And I talk about service being the eighth sacrament and it being this, that, that theologically um, for Catholics, the establishment of the Eucharist, the establishment of Holy Communion as sort of the, 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 the centerpiece of Catholic practice is commemorated at the Holy Saturday Mass three days before Easter. And um, yet the reading that is done from the Gospel at the Holy Saturday Mass is the reading of the washing of the feet. And there is no reason sacramentally why washing of the feet could not be a sacrament in the Catholic Church. And it indeed is an ordinance or a sacrament in other Christian denominations. Interestingly, in, in the Church of Christ, it is called the sacrament of equality. It's called the ordinance. They call it ordinances rather than sacraments. They call it the ordinance of equality. Mm -hmm. And it's because it brings the high low and the low are served by the high. Um, but my point is that I think the eighth sacrament is service. It hasn't been recognized as such, but it is the sacrament that the sisters, I think, represent. Um, in their ministries, also the men, of course. But um, well, it's it's attached to all, pretty much to all the sacraments, but it's not it's not verbalized. But it's not well. recognized as a, an official sacrament, of course. And yet, I would argue that it could be, and maybe it should be, because it would be a sacrament that was more accessible, not just to sisters, but to all people. So I've written about that. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with all of this only because I'm not a trained theologian. And when I venture, as we all are, when we venture into areas where we're not trained, I mean, I've never had a theology course in my life, uh, it becomes a little bit, you know, it's very easy to say, well, have you read blah, blah, blah? No. And, you know, I do try when people say you should read Acts. I, I do try. but So I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this. And that's why I've been pretty careful to check this out with the sacramental theologians because I don't want to embarrass myself and I don't want to put myself in a situation of putting myself in the center of an argument that I have no intention of starting and that I'm certainly in, in, unqualified to finish, right? So it's, but I do think I've got something here. I really do think I've got something here about the unintended consequence of what Pius X's reforms did in terms of deepening the clericalization of Catholic practice. And I think we see that in, in the modern world with the decline in the number of priests, um, that parishes are closed and communities are being upended um, because there aren't priests to serve those. And that is given primacy over perhaps ordaining married men, perhaps ordaining women, perhaps figuring out alternative ways of making the sacraments accessible to the people who want them. So while I don't really want to go there in a, in a really extensive way, 
in my article because I think that opens up a whole other area of analysis that I'm um, unlikely to have room to do in an article. Um, I do think there are connections to what's going on in the city of Syracuse where they closed, I don't know how many parishes in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, and this is by no means a unique place. So I do think it's an ongoing problem. I don't think it just affects sisters. Um, I don't think it's fully gendered, although I do think it is to some extent located around issues of a celibate male priesthood. Okay. Yes. There's a little general Go ahead. comment. I would last question. I, last last comment. Last comment. Yeah. No, I, I would focus that point on the effects of um, how can I say like the complete uh, reversion of some of the um, good things that the Second Vatican Council were trying to achieve in the sixties. So I would definitely agree with you. Big difference. There is a big um, even fight inside the Catholic Church since the 60s. No, I the would that uh, was shut down. Basically, it was shut down by Ratzinger, uh, yeah. 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 Benedictus, and yeah. yeah. uh, John Paul II. I so, would not argue with you at all. It, it's, it's really sad. So maybe that's part of you know, the root of the actual like present crisis of the Catholic Church all around the world. I would, I would fully agree with you. And I think, I'll get to make the last comment. And to your point, no, I think if you look at Pope Francis using yes. communion by talking about, it, it's your point, right. he's pointing out communion and trying to open this space because it is such an incredible source of power for the priesthood. And they have abused it, not just with this, yeah. but with divorced people or anyone yeah. who looks weird. Divorce or remarry. Right? I mean, LGBT it's just every parish priest arbitrarily yeah. gets to decide who gets communion. And, and I, and and I think Francis is trying to go back. And, and so yet, to Francis point. has also said that he has no intention of addressing, certainly, the male priesthood, and he's reluctant to address the celibate male priesthood, you know, the celibacy issue in the priesthood, although he, he's a little bit more open to that, perhaps, than he is, and for, for good reason, actually, canonically. But, um, yeah, I mean... I would like to see more work done on this by theologians because I'm not equipped to do it. I agree with you that there is a continuum here that goes into the present and the future that I'm not qualified to do, but I would love for somebody to do it. And if I write something that prompts somebody more qualified than I to do it, I'll be thrilled. <laughs> so if you know anybody who's a trained theologian who might be interested, Please, I have no desire to, you know, claim this as my little person. Send, send a copy to Hans Kuhn. There you go. It's a little old. <laughs> but, yes. That's all we have time for today. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Thank you. Thank you all.